Welcome, Albert and Lizette. You went all the way to the Philippines, survived two cyclones or typhoons, and aeroplane food, and now you're here. Thank, thank God you're here safe. And uh, I've been communicating with them while they're away because uh, I typhoons and I wasn't sure whether where they were but I thought we'd pray for them and and they hear God is good amen, amen? yep um, and also uh, many of others uh, welcome welcome what to preach what to preach there's so much to preach that it's hard to hard to choose but today God has given me a topic um, which I really needed, uh, and it's called Christian Service and Witness. So Christian Service and Witness. Before we start, let us have a word of prayer. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you that you've chosen me as a mouthpiece for you, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide me in what I say today, that will be words that come from you. And we ask also ask that you open our hearts, my heart, and the hearts of the congregation, that they would be ready to receive this message, and not only that, but to take it to heart and, and do your work as time is running out. So we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go through our Christian experience and being the start of a new year, start of a new year who likes new years yes good the if you want to live long have more new years right so more new years you have the longer you're going to live so that's the thing that we have to do and uh, but new years comes with a new brush a new room a new everything and we sometimes have to take stock. What I mean by take stock is that reflect on what we have done, what we are doing now, and where we are going. And what we have done in the past, we can't change, but we can learn from it. What we are doing now will shape the things of what is going to happen in the future. Is that correct? What you decide now, what you do now, is going to shape your future. So we as Christians, we, the fact that we are in this church here today on the Sabbath day indicates that we worship the true God, God of the Sabbath. Correct? Right? So we are at that point. Our walk with God through the Holy Spirit, our walk with Jesus is all different. We are at different levels, we uh, come from different backgrounds, but we are heading for the same destination. Is that correct? And the beauty of it is that the power to do this, to get to the end of time, comes from God. So we do not have to worry about that side. Where we have to worry is about our decision and our choices moment by moment daily and in the next few years is that we choose him always. If we choose him always, we will end up at the destination that he has chosen for us. Correct? Yeah, amen? So the Christian service, when we choose Jesus as our Savior, He chooses us to work for Him. He chooses us to work for Him. And I'll go through that uh, in the latter part of it. Um, but I would like to look at Matthew 3.16. We'll go to Matthew 3.16. But... The most of the sermon is going to be on Luke, uh, on the Gospel of Luke. Matthew 3, 16. Matthew 3 and verse 16. 
Are we there yet? Matthew 3, 16. And it says, and everyone got there? Yep, amen. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straight went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So this, how old was Jesus here? He was 30 years old, right? It is interesting to note that you, you cannot be a high priest unless you're 30 years old. So 30 years old, he starts his ministry, right? He starts his ministry, at he was anointed. So all the prophecies, and we're discussing prophecies this morning, prophecies where he was anointed starts at this date here, when he's 30 years old, right? The prophecies start when, when Christ comes. So the, the actual 70-week prophecy, would, which started at 457, Jesus comes in at 30 years old, and that's where it comes. And he has three and a half years cut in the middle of that, and then the Jewish people are given till, of, till the stoning of Stephen. Okay, how about Luke 3.16? So we go to Matthew 3.16, then we go to Luke 3.16. Luke 3.16, so Matthew, Mark, Luke 3.16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall b baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So he baptized, Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Ghost. So when did this happen? At Pentecost. Not to say that the Holy Ghost wasn't around, but it was given in its fullness at Pentecost. Right, Pentecost occurs in, in the third month of the Jewish calendar, the month number three, and it's also termed as the uh, Feast of Weeks. So from the resurrection, 50 days you get Pentecost, and that's um, Feast of Weeks, which um, we, we know as, uh, I think, Sivan. So we have Nisan, then we have Ia, and then we have Sivan. That's where in the Babylonian calendar is where Pentecost comes in. But God identifies his months numerically in the third month. Right? Okay, so we move down to Luke, and then we get down, go further down. We go to 21 and 22. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized and praying the heavens was open. And it confirms here as well in Luke's gospel, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Now, why am I giving you an account of Jesus' ministry? Because his ministry, which he began in the age of 30, he was baptized, anointed. He was set aside for God's use. In his case, his mission was to show the world the character of God and to pay the ultimate price. So, in our Christian service, and witness we are to show the world what Jesus did for us personally with our testimonials and our experiences with Jesus we tell others so that others too might see and capture that glimpse capture the beauty of Jesus and want to know him and that's why we tell people about Jesus not to say oh tell so that you can join my church no we are all sinners in, in a church that is a hosp hospital for sinners. 
but we need to be in a church that can cure us and draw us closer to Jesus rather than take us away from him and worshipping other things. So that's where. And the Holy Ghost has said, goes descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. This is in Luke 3.22. And a voice came up from heaven saying, which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. And then going through uh, the gospel, like the gospel of Luke, which I will be following, we get Luke 4, um, where it says, I'm just going to go through briefly, so you can follow me as you go in the gospel of Luke. Luke 4, verse 1, it's talking about and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Here he was tried and tested. And Jesus used his word to fight what? Well, the temptations of, of Satan. Now he was led into, at this point of time, he was led into the, he, was, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And then Jesus came and actually, uh, not Jesus, Satan came and tempted him. And the three temptations dealt with the three categories of sin. And we discussed it last week, in, uh, just mentioned it last week in Sabbath school, the three categories of sin that Satan gets us is possession or passion, possession and position or pride, right? So the three categories of sin we usually, that falls into these three categories are possession, material things, passion, right? And pride, vanity. And uh, Satan fell because of his pride, right? And he also coveted. He wanted position. He, he covered the whole lot. So now when we get to verse 13, so he was tempted and we get to verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. When we get to just verse 15, and what Jesus does, he goes into the synagogues in verse 15, and he taught in the synagogues being glorified of all. And then he, um, we get to verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been taught, brought up, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue. When did he go? On the Sabbath day. So we, Jesus observed the Sabbath. He was Lord of the Sabbath. And he stood up to read. And when we look at it, he said, what was he reading? Let's look at what he was re reading. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it and began to minister and sat down and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day, is the scripture fulfilled in your years? They knew exactly what he was talking about and they wanted to stone him because they thought he was taking the place of the Messiah. Was he taking the place of the Messiah? Yes, most definitely. But they didn't want to recognize that he was the Messiah. Now when we get to Luke 5, I'm just giving you a background, a sequence of events of the ministry of Jesus, how he ministered and how he actually evangelized the character of God and evangelized the sacrifice that he was going to, to actually set down. So Luke 5, he taught the people the word of God. When we get to Luke 5, 10, so just go up to 10, Luke 5, 10. It says, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon, and Jesus said unto them, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So now he's starting to recruit disciples. Prior to this, 
he, he was there preaching, and he was on the shore, but there were so many people that were pressing, you know, and I don't think Jesus wanted to get wet, right? People were pressing and, and crowd, and he's only got the Sea of Galilee behind him and a couple of boats. So he said to Simon, hey, pull the boats in, let's hop in the boat, and he preached from the boat. So after preaching, he, he went out, and he says, let's go, let's go fishing. Is that good? Let's go fishing. Hang on, it's broad daylight. These fishermen have been toiling all night. And he says, let's go fishing. He says, oh, Simon says, Lord, we've been fishing. There's nothing. But he says, nevertheless, anyway, they caught lots of fish. This was a miracle because they are fishermen. They had business in fish, fishing. So when Simon Peter in verse 8 saw he fell down at Jesus' feet, this is in Luke 5, uh, down at Jesus' knees, then laying, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished at all that were with him at the draught of the fish which they had taken. The draught of the fish was 153 fish. And I think I gave a sermon on the 153 fish, what it meant in, in the numerical meaning. Um, and it means that they are the sons of God. 153 means the sons of God numerically. So fear not, from henceforth, he says, I, you will be catching men. What did he mean by that? I don't think he knew, they knew what he meant by that. Okay, when we get down to, um, he's got all these disciples. He chose 12. Everyone was from Galilee except for Judas. Judas did not come from Galilee. He came from outside of Galilee. Um, from what I, I may be wrong, I don't think Judas, Judas was chosen. He just came into the group. So now he's got his disciples. So how do you train disciples? How do we as a church train new people coming in? What do you think is a good way? Any suggestions? Do we give them a book of instructions? What's that? By example. By example, right? So Jesus, by example, he taught his disciples. He went out, he preached the gospel. And as we started this morning, anything in God's word points to Jesus. He is the center, the author, and the finisher of our faith. Now, G Jesus witnessed, and Jesus also prayed. And we get to verse 16 in Luke 5. We get to 16, and after all the, uh, I would say, miracles that he did, healing people, most of the miracles were done on the Sabbath to actually point to the Pharisees that it is good to do good on the Sabbath. But in 16, and it says there, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. We, when we are witnessing when we're doing God's work, we are doing Christian service. Jesus had to pray. Do you think we have to pray? I'm sure that is a very big part, if not the main part. Why? With prayer comes guidance, with prayer comes instruction, with prayer comes, I suppose, repentance, forgiveness of sin. We have to pray for all these. So, when we do Christian service and witnessing, if we are not praying, we cannot do it. I would say it would be impossible. You know the three things in a Christian life, right, is prayer, study, and what's the third one? Witnessing, right? Witnessing, service and witnessing. Service and witnessing come, go hand in hand. Prayer is like breathing, right? God's word is like nourishment, and witnessing is like exercise. How long will you last without breathing? One and a half minutes, two minutes, three minutes, very short. How about eating? 
For me, one and a half minutes, two minutes, three minutes, right? A bit, a bit longer, right? Maybe a few days, sometimes up to a month, especially if you've got water. What about exercise? Are we spiritually fat? What I mean, that we're taking all this food, but we don't exercise. Exercising our, I suppose, all this knowledge has gone in and our heads get so big and spiritually become so fat, and then we, when we're so fat, we can't witness, we can't do service. And we get that way sometimes. How do we get out of it? We have to do little exercise at a time, right? When you are spiritually fat, don't go door knocking, right? Where you are, you've got to be really strong and, and fit spiritually to handle the rejection and all those other things. Start small first, right? Work on yourself and then work on your family or friends and things like that. And then you'll get leaner spiritually, right? So start small and then you'll be fit Christians to go out and do God's work in a mighty way. And when the whole church is doing that, then you get a movement of people doing God's work. Then this movement of people has to have a mission so to do God's work. And when we are ready like that, the Holy Spirit can be released and given in a full measure. That's what the latter rain's all about. So we as individuals have to start being lean Christians, fit Christians. So that's something. And Jesus showed this. He showed that witness, prayer. Did he take the hard knocks while he was doing that? There was always a group of people trying to knock him off. Why? Because Satan knew that if he couldn't knock Jesus off and get him to sin, then that's it. God's government is a failure. It's going to be a failure. So, and when we get to all this healing, you get to Luke 7. We get all this healing. Let's, let's do, he um, withdrew and prayed. Luke 5, 18. Let's not rush ahead. 5.18, And behold, man brought a, in a bed a man which was taken with palsy, and they sought means to bring him in, and to lay him before him. And they, when they could not find a way, they might bring him in, because there was so much of a crowd, they went on top of the roof, because in the eastern homes where it's hot, the actual roof, you can go right up top, and actually they used to dry their food up there, dry their clothes up there, and you can get up there. And so they lowered him down from the roof. They broke it up and, and uh, threw the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. Now, I heard a sermon years ago on this. And just the fact that, did the man, was he able to get himself up on the roof and come down on his own? No, he was with palsy. So how did he manage to do it? He had help he had friends now i call them friends because if they weren't friends they wouldn't have taken the trouble to help him these friends had faith in jesus or else they wouldn't have brought him to jesus now when people need help out there they need friends and we can be their friends we need to be their friends to care en enough about them to lift them out of the mire and put them in the midst of Jesus so that he, could, he can heal them. So, you know, that man, he says, when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So this was a... The words used had other people in mind as well, especially the Pharisees, because they were not considering him as God. They, they didn't, he was just a, a nuisance to them because everyone was following him and not coming to the synagogue or, or doing that. So when we look at this, Jesus establishes the Sabbath in Luke 6, when we go there, 
came to pass on the second Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, he went through the cornfields and, and plucked. So things are happening that were restricted by the Pharisees on the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was a burden. Sabbath was a burden, and Jesus came to change this around. So Jesus came to say, on the Sabbath, we spend time with God, but it is also a time to do good, right? To good, to meet each other, to have fellowship, and to help others. Now, when we get to verse 7, uh, sorry, chapter 7 and verse 20, I'm rushing along here, mainly because I want to get to the crux of the matter. This is how Jesus was doing, but the central point of this is what Jesus taught his disciples, and we have to use the same. So John the Baptist was around at the time, but he was taken into prison. So he was taken into prison, but in prison he's, he's thinking, well, if I was John the Baptist, which I'm not, but if I was John the Baptist, I'm thinking, oh, I've been doing God's work. I'm sure I've been doing, I, I even baptized Jesus, and now I'm in prison. Why doesn't he come and get me out? You know, so I could help him. So he's languishing there. So he sends his disciples out. And two of them. And uh, two of them said, basically, are you the Christ? Or uh, let's look at verse 20 in Luke 7. Luke 7, verse 20. It says here, when the men came unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? He's saying, Are you the Messiah? Or shall we look for another Messiah? What did Jesus say? Yes, I'm the Messiah. You go tell John I'm the Messiah. No, he didn't say that. So he says, Come follow me. Look what I'm doing, basically. Just, just for a day, see what I do. So by example, he gave that information to the two disciples of John the Baptist. And then in verse 22, he says, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. We can take this, we are not Jesus, we can't do miracles. We can, if God use, uses us. But we can follow the same thing. Go your way and tell John the things you have seen and heard. We can go away after encountering Jesus and tell others about the things we have learned about Jesus. Is that right? We can do that. How that the blind see, we can go out and actually, those who are blind to the gospel, blind to God's word, we can go out and show them God's word and make them see. Lame to walk, those who are crippled by sin, those who are unable to walk in the footstep of Jesus, we can lift them up through the gospel and help them to walk with Jesus. How the lepers are cleansed, we and others, we can help. Once we are cleansed, we, like the ten lepers, right? We, when we are cleansed, we can actually go and help others to be cleansed by Jesus. How about those who want, don't want to hear the word of God? They're deaf to the ear, word of God. When they hear, or when they listen, they do not hear, or vice versa. Right, they go. Some they when they hear the word of God, they go la 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 la. I don't want to know. Right, I don't want to know. Why? Because I don't want to change my lifestyle. So we can help the deaf hear. How do we do that if they don't want to hear? We can pray. We can pray, even if we don't tell them others that may come along. The dead are raised. We can't raise the dead, but those who do not know Jesus are dead, dead in their sins. And we can give them Jesus, show them Jesus, and actually raise them spiritually. Poor to the gospel is preached. How about the poor? Poor in spirit. 
those who are poor in spirit. They might be rich in material goods, but they are poor in spirit, which means they are poor. Because at the end of time, we have to give all those up. And we haven't got the spirit of God, we are poor. Right? So we can do that. So we might not be able to follow exactly in the footsteps of Jesus in the sense of healing the sick and all the physical things, but he's given us the Holy Spirit that we can do these things. Now, why am I preaching this, this sermon at the start of the year? We have a brand new team of young and not so young people young in a sense of christian young and not so young in the sense of not so young uh, been in the christian faith for a long not you never read by the way any pastors here no no pastors here if you think you're retired you might be retired from the conference but not from god's work okay no one retires from god's work so we we all until he comes to take us home with us we all have a work to do I'm preaching this, the Holy Spirit's given me this at short notice, and um, this just came up. We need to be dedicated as a church to move forward. We can't be languishing, just coming to church and this church is not growing. We cannot do that anymore. Time is too short. And for us to actually move ahead, personally, personally, every one of us, need to spend time with god we need to pray we need to have that altar in our house right wake up early in the morning put your alarm come to church early don't come five minutes late or while it's halfway come to church early why can't you come to church early because if you put god first you can come to church early you need to come to church early i'm stressing this because we get here at sabbath school and it's only a handful of people not good enough right god is here waiting don't keep him waiting right we need to come to church how do you come to church early set your alarm right put a bucket of water up there when the alarm goes right oh i'm awake right you say oh god's spirit's washed over me right you're awake and you get up whatever it takes get your wife to wake you up if your wife gets up earlier Get your dog to wake you up, right? Do something. But get up, plan it, organize your time so that you are here 15 minutes before it starts. So that you've got five minutes for personal prayer and song service. Please do that. If this church is going to go ahead, that is number one. Spend time with God. No spend time with God, no church going ahead very simple very simple right come here early if you come here even earlier you can join the group in prayer at nine o'clock i encourage you to do that right join the group in prayer because we need it we elders deacons all those in leadership positions need this prayer because we are fallible as well young ones right we've got a young team this as elders and all that but I am praying for a dedicated team. Young or old, you need to be dedicated or it doesn't work. Yeah? It doesn't work. I don't worry about all the other churches around us. They've got their own thing. But this church in Northern Avon Valley, right, we need to get our act together. What better time than the start of the year? Right? Amen? So make a pact with God. Make a promise with God. And get him to keep you honest in a sense that you spend time with him. Priorities. Is work a priority? Yes, to put food on the table. But it's not as important as knowing God. If you have to start work at 7, get up at 5. Jason messaged me. He said, hey, we should, we should actually get together on the phone and we can pray and study and discuss things on the phone. And I know it won't work between Jason and I because we've got different schedules. But we have our own schedule, but maybe once or twice a week we can hook up when both of our schedules are a bit free. And we can spend an hour on the phone and say, hey, you know, the lesson or something that's coming up, 
I encourage you to do that. Have a prayer partner. Someone like that, that you can discuss things. These are the things that strengthen us, draw us closer to God. Now, the Christian service and witness. Okay, that's to strengthen ourselves. You know, in an airplane, and the airplane's going down, right? Like this earth is going down. Do you believe that? If you don't, well, the Bible says it's going down, right? So you need to believe the Bible if you don't believe me. Believe the Bible that this earth hasn't got much longer to go. We look at the catastrophes and they're using terms like apocalyptic and all those sort of things. And you think, wow, you know, this is going down. In an airplane, they say oxygen mask dropping down, right? The oxygen mask is like God's word. Yeah, it's prayer. Drop down. They say you use it first before you help someone else. In God's plan, you make sure you are healthy and fit before you can help someone or else you both go down, right? So you need to do that. I need to do that. It, it is something that um, we just have to do. It's pertinent to our, our spiritual growth. There's no, no choice, by the way. You can't just keep rolling along year after year. This is 2020. We need perfect vision this year. We need eyes with 2020 vision, right? To see the end from now we have to look right to the end you know where that 2020 comes from okay at the doctor's thing you know eye surgeon whatever you want to call him right um he's got a chart at the end there and the actual distance between that chart to where you are before you read the chart is actually six meters or 20 it's actually 20 feet <laughs> if you know what i mean in the old money and six meters in the new money that's your 20 meters from 20 feet you can can read the whole lot, right? That's 2020 vision. I take my contacts off or my glasses off. The two big letters in the front, I can't even see that. I can see a blurred thing, you know? So I need eye salve, I need so all those sort of things that I need to see, all right? So the contacts are actually that I have in one eye only, because this one annoys me, so I throw it away. <laughs> Because the Bible is very biblical. It says, one, your eye is, is not doing it. Pluck it out and throw it away. So I just took it in the context off. But I see clearer. That context is actually like the Holy Spirit making us see God's word clear. Right? Now, God's call to service, he is depending on our, the human agent. You think God can get his angels and just say, you spread the gospel in the world. He can do that and the gospel will go throughout the world. But, as his representatives, I'm getting this from Acts of the Apostles, page 134. As his representatives among men, God does not choose angels who have never fallen, but human beings like men of like passions with those they seek to save. Christ took humanity that he might reach humanity. A divine human saviour was needed to bring salvation to the world and to men and women has been committed the sacred trust of making known the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable riches of Christ. What does that mean? Anyone know? If you can't search it, can you find it? Unsearchable riches. What it's saying basically is that there is no end. You want to search the richness of, of a, a rich man, you go to his bank account and look what assets he has. That's it. He's a three billionaire. That's all he's got. Or you go to my account and it says, doesn't even go out there. <laughs> right? So, and then you go to someone else's account and, and they haven't even got a house to live in. So it's all relative. But in Christ's richness, it's not material. It's the richness of love. It's the richness of character. So that's, we search it. The more we come to Christ, the more we search it, the more there is we find. Do you find that? Do you find that? When you spend time with Jesus and you look through his word, and more and more, there's just no end to it. So, look upon 
the touching scene, behold the majesty of heaven, surrounded by the 12 whom he has chosen. So we went through that. He's about to set them apart for their work by these feeble agencies. We look at Peter, we look at Thomas, we look at Judas, and we look at the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. Through his word and spirit, he designs to place salvation within the reach of all. Right? So, God chose 12 feeble people, but look at them when the Holy Spirit came to them at Pentecost. Were they feeble? No, they had been with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was able to raise them up with, I suppose, braveness, courage, with sacrifice. Except for John, all of them were martyred. So, we are in that time where we have to be 110%, if that's such a thing, but all in, all in. So I'm looking at how many people here? One, two, three, four, five. That's about 30 odd people here. Vel, how many people? 22. And children? Right. Okay. We're a handful of people here. How many people in Northern? 7,000 in Northern. We're less than 0.5%. Right? Less than 0.5%. Is it possible? Come on, everyone should say yes. Of course, it is possible. They had 12, and how many billion people in the world that, uh, that know Jesus? Billions, right? They had 12 they started with. So it is possible because God gives us the Holy Spirit. We have to pray for it. We have to prepare our hearts for it. So I am going to close now with one thought that and if the only thing you get out of this today is that I would encourage you and me to spend time with Jesus. Yeah? Plan it. If you don't plan it, it is not going to happen. Write it down. Set a time aside. Don't be Sabbath Christians only. Right? That should, this, today should be a day of celebration, a day of fellowship, a day of coming together because God has set a time that He's given us, 24 hours, right? So if, if you, all of us, set a time aside three times a day to spend time with Jesus. If, if you're at work during the day, your lunch break, even 10 minutes, to just a few verses and prayer to keep you on the straight and narrow. Amen? Okay, let us stand and sing the last hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
Let us bow our heads. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you so much, your Holy Spirit, and who has given us a, a sight of Jesus. And we want to thank you that we, as we spend time with you, that we will see him more clearly and want to be like him. And we can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we want to thank you that you've given us this power. So we ask that as we go in and enjoy this fellowship time together, that you come with us, dear Lord, that that our conversations will be of you and what you've done for us and what you will be doing for us. And we give you thanks and praise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.